the obscure why, that by about that time it was possible to make more profit in uh, shenanigans of money manipulation than in doing anything productive. And in market societies, uh, people with capital go for what's pro uh, profitable. Uh, one corollary to that was that the political pressure just uh, dismantled the regulatory apparatus uh, with the support of economists, incidentally, working with uh, th economic theories that, I mean, it's astonishing that they're not ashamed of themselves. But uh, anyway, that's what happened. Uh, one consequence of this, one aspect of it, is that for roughly 30 years, a little over that, uh, for the majority of the population, wages have real wages have pretty close to stagnated. A little growth, but not much. Uh, that's most of the population. Um, uh, families get by with uh, uh, two husband and wife working. We have very limited support systems as compared with other countries, so that means families are in trouble, and that shows up in all kinds of ways. Uh, people are, uh, you can keep your income up by uh, uh, asset inflation, you know, just, and by debt. The asset inflation, of course, can't last. So you have repeated bubbles of collapsing. The last one was an $8 trillion housing bubble, which amazingly almost no economist could see. I mean, the trend line in housing prices is going way beyond a 100-year record. There was no reason for it. It was obviously going to burst. That's, every, you know, that's the assets of most people. They're in trouble. People are in deep trouble. You know, not trouble like uh, Central Africa, but that's not the way you evaluate your circumstances. Mm -hmm. You ask, uh, how would I, what should I be able to have in a rich country like this? So people are, and they also see us ostentatious wealth. It's quite striking that the, for a, for a while after the financial collapse, uh, the super rich were kind of playing it cool, you know, so they weren't not too try to not be too ostentatious, doesn't look nice. But now it's over. Uh, the New York Times a couple of days ago had a front page article saying, describing exactly this phenomenon, you know, back to great parties, uh, gala events, uh, showing off how rich, rich we are. Uh, another article in the same issue said, uh, corporate profits have broken records, uh, banks have so much money they don't know what to do with it. Well, you know, people may not know the details, but they can see this. And they can see what's happening in their own lives. Uh, in manufacturing industry, uh, um, unemployment's about at the rate of the Great Depression. And much, I'm, an old, I'm old enough to remember that. Uh, and it was bad, but there was, it was, there was a kind of hopefulness. There was, I know my, my relatives are mostly unemployed workers, but you know, they were not desperate. They were poor, but not desperate, because it looked like something could happen. We could do things together. There's a better future. My seamstress aunts who were unemployed were in the garment workers union and they got some benefits from that and they also felt that also some educational programs, cultural programs, they felt that we can get out of this working together. People don't feel that now. And those manufacturing jobs are not coming back. Not unless we have quite a different social order here. There's plenty of need for them. In fact, what's happening in this respect is sometimes almost surreal. Like, for example, the government effectively owned most of the auto industry for a while. And the policies they were pursuing was closing down plants, just like GM had been doing. Uh, at the same moment, uh, Obama's uh, transportation secretary was in Europe uh, traveling around Spain uh, trying to get contracts using stimulus money for Spanish factories to produce high-speed uh, transport for the United States, which we desperately need, as anyone who's taken a train here knows. Uh, that's, these are things could be produced very well in uh, Michigan and Indiana. Uh, maybe not profitable for the bankers, but certainly good for the workforce and the communities. But that wasn't even considered an option. I mean, green technology, which is supposed to be the expanding area. Mm -hmm. Go to China, go to Spain, go to Germany. I mean, uh, investors in the United States, last figures I saw, are uh, investing, I think, about twice as much in China as they are in the United States and Europe combined. And in Germany, Spain, France, there's 
substantial and China will presumably be the leader and if it isn't already in uh, wind and solar technology that can't that be done here sure it can in fact a lot of the uh, high technology the innovations uh, the ideas come from here but they're produced there you know China is kind of like an assembly plant which uh, where you the surrounding industrial area in the United States uh, assemble the products that come back here that we buy but it could be produced here that takes different social policies and as long as uh, policy is in the hands of uh, uh, financial institutions and uh, uh, a, a, corp a, 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 a production corporations like say General Electric GM which are themselves financial institutions a lot of their business you know they make plenty of money if it's done somewhere else. the economies change All right, can you hear me? Okay, so can you just tell me roughly uh, what you get it or kept you understand from whatever he spoke for six minutes? Any idea? It's got something to do with what we are going to discuss today, but I would like to uh, leverage on what you said. More important, um, this guy is a philosopher, he's got a very broad view of the world, very interesting person, although when he speaks sometimes can be quite, make you sleepy, quite boring. But he's got a lot up in his head there. Any idea what he said that might be relevant for us to understand neoliberalism uh, between in 1991 or 1992 all the way to 2016 so he was speaking the interview was 2016 any idea i give you about three minutes to think about this okay because this is very important for us so in three minutes i come back to you please type out Okay, housing bubble is beautiful. But the last part, if you hear what he said, can, can you recall what he said at the last part? Yeah. So, if you really need to speed up second time, oh, okay. I can't remember. Okay. All right, then. I guess a lot of people were just uh, letting the video run. I'll put it on uh, IP underscore UOL later. Okay. Let me do it now. Or later I'll do it. Okay, so I, I've been putting up um, a lot of uh, videos and not say videos, articles, you know. So now uh, there's a high risk in the world economy of stagflation. Stagflation of inflation and slow growth, okay? So stagflation is... Inflation and slow growth. So if it's uh, low inflation, not too bad. If it's high inflation, well, it's going to be very difficult for... A lot of policy makers so if you listen to what he was saying yeah, i'll just tell you slightly uh, summarize a bit of it he's complaining about how uh, the last part when you're talking about the train the high-speed train can be produced in in america michigan but they, the americans didn't do it policy makers obama obama's administration went to spain to get contracts for people to you know um, 
manufacture the train, which actually uh, American companies could easily do it, like GM or General Electric. But that's the reason why behind it. The reason behind it, it's um, the American companies can invest in those companies that, or can get a higher return from or lower cost from uh, Spain when Spain produces it. So in, in America, the cost is too high. But then again, um, what is bad? What is bad? Can I ask? When I just, what I just said. If everything is bought in Spain, bought in Germany, bought in China, even the green technology stocks, all these are outsourced there and bought from there. What is, what is so bad about it? So I'm also trying to ask you, what is so bad about new liberalism? Any idea? If you didn't get my question, say, please repeat your question. If you're thinking, then I'll just let you think. Okay, um, Chomsky said that uh, Obama wanted to get some, develop some, or build some high-speed train in America. So instead of going to Michigan, in America, where they have the capability to do it, but at a higher cost, um, I think they give a contract to a Spanish company, okay, to manufacture the high-speed train. And also, when he mentioned about green technology, uh, a lot of it were actually uh, bought from German companies and Chinese companies, okay. So, what is wrong with it? Okay, more developed countries outsource negative externality to trade and industry. And what's that externality you're talking about, GM? In our course, what's the externality? Negative externality. Outflow of jobs, loss of jobs in local economy. Or rather, you are not... Okay, so in IP, when we look at jobs, then we are also relating to manufacturing, right? So he said specifically manufacturing jobs. Okay. Um, the productive power it's uh, badly affected, affected it becomes a lackluster the performance of their manufacturing sector so any um, superpower will have to consistently have manufacturing okay. I'm not sure if I put it up on IP UOL um, there are five sectors that America needs to uh, continue to you know, be the front runner, front runner of the globe uh, in these sectors here. One is super com quantum computing, artificial intelligence. Okay, so I'll put that up. Also, please go take a look. If they lose that, then they lose their competitive advantage. Would this would doing this not help other state economies? Yeah, it's actually helping, um, pushing the job, outsourcing is pushing a job for other people to do it at a lower cost. Okay, but then at the same time, um, the the MNCs or even the government spend lesser. But the MNCs, right, usually they outsource to companies where American MNCs have collaboration with Spanish companies, with German companies, with Chinese companies. So the M US MNCs are making more profit out of it. So that's the whole thing about financialization. Okay, it is not about um, helping the local economy to grow in a sustainable manner. Okay. So Gibber, did I answer your question? Uh, comparative advantage. Uh, if you take comparative advantage, then you are looking at trade-offs. So from a perspective of IPE, um, if you take comparative advantage, then you're going to, like for America, they forego manufacturing which is not a good thing because you lose productive power. So America, uh, from a perspective of power, we should have absolute advantage in both manufacturing and uh, in R&D. Got it, Alice? But in the economies will say, yeah, you know what, you should do, you should outsource to China because they've got cheap labor, cheap land. But from the perspective of politics, and since you're a superpower, you need to create jobs for your people. You know, you lose your learning curve. Uh, comparative advantage, it's uh, 
it's not a good thing for a country like America. So that experiment of neoliberalism was basically financialization. Okay, so it helped the MNCs to become more powerful. Um, if we don't already know, the MNCs are the agent, you know, the primary agent in globalization for the neoliberal era. So um, it all came to an end 2016. Uh, you have Donald Trump. He's asking the he was asking the MNCs to realign their production network. Okay, but manufacturing jobs going back to America. I think only the high end manufacturing, but at least better than nothing. Okay, so similarly in Singapore, we outsource a lot of things. Uh, we outsource. We used to have the roadworks, the PWD. PWD was done a department of PUB. Okay, and then they co they financialized, they corporatized it, and then you know became a private limited, became a Thomas Sibling company. It's called CPG Corporation. Okay, so CPG was sold to a Chinese company. So they got our learning curve all these years that the British uh, developed for us, public work department. Um, the regulatory staff is still in Singapore, but the, the legwork, okay, uh, the piping and all, they sold, they commercialized it and then they sold it to the Chinese company. So the Chinese company are actually servicing our roads and also CPG is a company that provides services for town council. Okay, so, but because the Chinese, uh, based on comparative advantage, the Chinese will bring in cheaper workers, uh, the services will be cheaper, and um, China, that company will pro uh, specialize in those things. Okay, but Singapore government not able to uh, specialize and produce at a lower cost. So the economic theory, right, has resulted in a lot of our learning curve in terms of uh, building construction, engineering, uh, roadwork engineering. All these have been outsourced. So that is why you see in Singapore a lot of foreign workers come in because all these companies are really uh, financialized. So the companies that are under Tamasic, okay, mainly they go for profits. All right. So um, Tamasic is very focused on profit. And not focus on learning curve. And Tomasic would go around the region to find uh, companies to have joint venture, invest in them, and uh, you know contribute to the cost saving um, um, methods in Singapore. So at the same time, when you have cost saving, you lose employment in Singapore. Okay, but you create em or I would say lose employment. For those people who were working formerly for the stat boards, they were replaced by uh, cheaper workers that, you know, like CPG, they will get Chinese engineers. Okay, then they will get, um, they will outsource to other companies that can bring from Bangladesh and India to do the landscaping and all. Okay, so all these, it's all mainly for profit. And you can see that Tomasic and Tomasic especially, and uh, Tomasic main companies, Capital and all these, they uh, have very high profit, the CEOs, the shareholders all make a lot of money. Okay, so it's driven basically by uh, profit maximization objective there. So Chomsky was also explaining that, you know what, um, not a problem that they can do it cheaper, but the problem is the jobs are gone. And it could have been done in America with a high speed. Okay, so um, if you really ask me, Donald Trump came in and he pushed or make America great again, it's like make in America, is um, one of the focus is to restart manufacturing. But to do the low-end manufacturing is a bit tough. Okay? So they will do high-end manufacturing in America. And uh, Singapore is following suit. So you see in the advertisement, let me just show you. You see the defense company in Singapore. Okay, this is Singapore News. Uh, 
250 employees prepare for recovery. A debt was in uh, just recently in the news. Yeah. So they're going to prepare for 2022. Okay. So you will bring manufacturing back, you will bring uh, the high end of all these uh, services sector back to America. Very interesting. At the same time, um, the low end manufacturing can never be done in America again. Okay. So at least you have manufacturing because manufacturing represents your productive power. So um, is Donald Trump just an idiot? He's just a symptom of what is lacking in America. Okay. And the, the whole purpose of uh, Donald Trump coming up or to see how exactly America is doing uh, is to show that there's really a gap and the inequality is really bad. Okay, which means to say that the interdependence okay, that you see right in front of you, the word interdependence, that was created, fostered, okay, and exacerbated after um, 1991, when America was on the world global economy, was uh, characterized by unipolar uh, world, and, and America was the hegemon, and the MNCs were making lots of money, and today, these MNC, MNCs are more powerful than the states. Okay, and you can see a con a company like BlackRock. Um, if I'm not sure, it's about fourteen trillion dollars. If I'm not wrong, okay, they have fourteen trillion dollars asset under management. And um, what really happened is the inequality in America has really uh, gone worse. Okay, so capitalism has its limit and. Uh, if you look at it, we are really past that new liberal world. So the things that we use to study, like all those engineering, uh, also become obsolete. So if you do ask me, right, the education, the education that we, and the amount of money we spend, okay, uh, has been wait, uh, wasted really. So we have to restart again. So the whole no new liberal thing was actually. Uh, not to the disadvantage of the American government. The American government had an advantage over it. Why? Because when you outsource to other countries, right, like the Asian NIEs or Southeast, um, like Singapore, Japan, South Korea, okay, and then subsequently China and Vietnam, okay, uh, you do not need to spend on infrastructure. Do you get it? Because those countries will be the ones that will be spending on infrastructure. You don't need to spend on infrastructure. Okay? So the American uh, Federal Reserve don't need to look at fiscal policy. What is fiscal policy? It's uh, government spending. Okay, so the government spending has dropped in America uh, by a lot, but um, the only thing that the American government is doing is increasing debt. Okay, for people to buy from abroad. Okay, then that is um, also very interesting because America becomes the biggest consumer of the Chinese um, MNCs that come up today, of the A Asian NIEs. So they are the ones with the buying power. But at the same time, the government does not need to spend on infrastructure. Yeah, they, they, they increase that. That means the government borrow uh, issuing U.S. Treasury and then allow the banks to also let out, you know, to Americans and 2000, from 2000 onwards, right? But even worse, because without credit worthiness, you can also just uh, get a loan in America. So a lot of cheap money going out there. Okay, so property price boom, and there was a housing bubble like what uh, Chomsky was saying. So everybody was like just overspending, not spending within the means. A lot of loans going on there. Okay, then by 2008, um, of course, Lehman Brothers collapsed uh, because the amount of debt that they had, they went through some financial instrument created by all these uh, Wall Street uh, bankers that 
it could not sustain itself. Okay, so the whole American economy was financialized, and the government didn't have the kind of debt like um, you know what South Asian NIEs would have. The kind of debt that Asian NIEs would have would be they spend money on the infrastructure. But the kind of debt that American government would have is they lend cheaply to consumers of Asia. Okay, do you get that? So a lot of people say that uh, America is barely injured. Uh, I don't think so because they spend so little on infrastructure. You just go to America, I'm not sure if you've been there. You look at the infrastructure, it's very really horrific. Okay, your car is your public transport. The school system is down. The hospitals, their private one, are good. Okay. Um, so only like California is great, but if you go like mid Midwest and all this, uh, wow, it can be quite horrific. And so the interdependence was to really maximize profit for MNCs. Okay, so they are actually uh, the ones that control the financial institution, uh, financial market also. Okay, so GE itself is not just doing light bulbs. They are actually they have financial um institutions as well okay ge finance or something like that so everything was all based on profits and uh, when we look at inequality you see that actually uh, inequality ex accelerated from 1970s all the way to 2016 okay that acceleration was because uh, mncs were going around uh, buying uh, land and owning government um, in the, the institutions in, in, in other countries because they financialize right, those companies, the stat boards like in Singapore. And then it's listed in the stock market, the big venture capitalist firms who also uh, have a lot of networks in manufacturing, they buy into those uh, com uh, listed companies across the world. Okay, so uh, BlackRock is one, Goldman Sachs, you know, Citibank and all these, they, they own a lot of companies around the world. Okay, so because of the financialization, uh, workers lose their, you know, their, or they don't lose, their, their wages never seem to increase, but the profit seems to increase for the MNCs. Okay, so there's a tension between the MNC and the workers, and uh, government agencies are did not did not want to implement minimum wage. Okay. Even here in Singapore, minimum wage is like a socialist way of doing things. But all that changed because uh, now America also start to have minimum wage. All that changed because, uh, because of the uh, social problems that has actually started to you know, emerge in all those countries. So you see Amazon has uh, minimum wage. Singapore also start to have minimum wage. Okay, so this is very clear cut that neoliberalism has actually, uh, you know, passed its peak. All right, but of course, Singapore government will always say that we are still for globalization. That doesn't mean that they will continue with that financialization. Okay, my question to you now: In if you've been following the financial market in Singapore, what is it tells us that we are somewhat going through the financialization any news that you can relate to think about it for a while monetary policy no not monetary, not monetary policy look at the companies that the government own Any company, crypto investment uh, no. in Singapore, how do you know that we are moving away from financialization or scale back on financialization, which is called de-financialization? I ask this question to see whether you understand what I'm talking about electrical industry became uh, is it power retail the power industry are you talking about that even?
Okay, going green. Um, okay, electrical. So you can see um, that's not really clear cut because you still have SP um, Singapore Power coming to step in. So definancialization. Okay, Prem Transport. Okay, what exactly? Which company tells you that we have actually definancialized the transport? Bus companies. Not really. Not really. Okay, maybe I'll show you a newspaper article. The moment this happened, then it's the start of, or the end of financialization, or the start of definancialization. And if you're aware of it, you would have read this in, uh, I'm not too sure which year was this. SMRT to be delisted from SGX after 16 years. Okay. 18 October 2016. So, when you financialize, that means you take that SMRT that was a, a government entity. So, SMRT was supposed to provide a public good. It's a public transport. Okay? But then they got messed up because they were trying to make it private, public, partnership, you know, those kind of uh, campaign that they were advocating have, you have a public good, but you still have uh, um, efficiency in terms of finance. Uh, it is not, you know, losing money. Okay, So they wanted to list it, list it on the stock market and they list it on the stock market. The whole purpose was to show um, that SMRT will be following all the market principles, the okay, free market principle. But of course, uh, SMRT, you know, didn't do a good job. What happened? Can anyone tell me? You might have experienced this yourself. Okay, a lot of breakdowns, right? So they cut corners. They, they, they tried to push the cost as low as possible. And uh, they get all the engineers just to just uh, stand around and not doing anything, never really do the servicing, the maintenance was low. And then there was this woman by Miss Saw, or whatever her name was, from DFS, okay? So duty-free uh, service, right? Her job was to do what? Her job was to make sure the retail part of SMRT. So SMRT wasn't just about the train system. It was about creating that experience when you come out from the MRT or going into the MRT with all these shops to collect rent for SMRT. So they ran out all these shops, okay? So uh, to modernize or create an experience for people who take um, MRT service, okay? Yeah, Dolby got exchange and all these things here. So, so her job, she was focusing on that consumer experience, not so much on the train ride. And uh, what happened? There was overcrowding. Uh, more or less case was all time high. Breakdown was all time high. Uh, people couldn't even go up to the train. And uh, you had ministers coming out say we still haven't reached full load. We can push harder. I think that was Josephine Teo, as usual. Okay, she was crazy about you know profit driving profit and profit and profit because they would have. Um, all these profits and distributed among themselves. So the whole financialization actually didn't work out. So 2016, it was delisted because of uh, what happened in 2011. They lost one GRC. In 2015, uh, they tried to, you know, for four to five years, they tried to solve the problem and they couldn't solve because if you were to really maintain everything, they will start declaring losses. So they delist it and no more have financial 
no, no longer sensitive to the financial market, whatever investors have in their mind. Okay, so this is one way of looking at de-financialization. Okay, can you, can you understand what I'm saying? Just to recap, just to get an assurance from you. Do you, ex do you understand this example? Yeah, so, so this is one clear example uh, that Singapore from 2016 also um, moved out of neoliberalism. Okay, I wouldn't say totally out of neoliberalism, but the financialization of our system um, has actually uh, passed it, we have passed it altogether. And 2016 was a clear signal and nobody believed me. Uh, because they thought that, yeah, maybe, you know, they just do it for that one. How do they manage to stay uh, financialized? Um, they really focus on maintenance. So uh, they don't focus on that collecting rent. So I think their, their profits are, were not high, but, you know, it was quite balanced in that, in that sense. Then. Got it? So for Singapore, it was focused more on collecting rent. So that's why you see they like to build more MRP um, stations for the purpose of collecting rent. And when you collect the, when you build that train station, right, that area, the, the land can be bought over by SMRT. Okay, so SMRT will own the land. So basically you're transferring the land from the private owner to SMRT. And, or the government SLA trans, that sell that land after development, the SMRT is given the land. Okay. Similarly, Changi Airport, okay, so it's under Changi Airport Group, it's a government investment company. And when they corporatize it, okay, Changi Airport Group was like a department of Ministry of Finance or EDB. Okay. Then when they became an investment company, the government transferred the land area of Changi Airport. Now you're going to have five, six terminal. That land belongs to Changi Airport Group. So that's why the yeah, capitalization increased dramatically. Okay. So it's the same with SMRT. And all these uh, make Singapore look very, very rich. Okay. So uh, if this area is like an open area, the grass, let's say Pailiba, what you do? is they redevelop the area. In case there are shop houses, they remove them. And then they build a Paliba Square beneath. You have MRT, you have a lot of shops and a lot of food court and all these. And that is all money. Increase the value of the land. But the money goes to SMRT. Got it? At the same time, um, they also have another company that complement SMRT. Uh, the company will be capital mall, capital land, you know, office building, malls. So that's how they grow their wealth by modernizing Singapore. And all of it will financialize. They don't put it under Ministry of Finance or Ministry of National Development or Ministry of Transport or whatever. That company is a private limited okay, um, that is under the portfolio of Tomasic Moving. That's how they do how we did the financialization. Okay. Then uh, the world has changed because more and more people will do e-commerce and um, you will not do shopping out there. And you can see that the amount of sunk cost that we have in developing all these things. Now the government is like trying very hard to push people to go back to work. At the same time, at the same time, get more tourists to come to Singapore Okay, buy things like Seven Eleven, whatever. Not as long as something is moving, there is a chance for them to um, increase their profit. Okay, so but this is very tough for um, the whole system here. Okay, uh, the prime minister is having a hard time because uh, no matter how they say we open up for the VTL vaccinated travel lane. Right? Uh, the world still look at Singapore with high infection rate. In fact, we have 5,000, more than 5,000 um, yesterday, right? And a lot of people, younger people are getting it, not just the old people are getting infected. Okay, so this, this thing that if it drags on, right, the financialization will be affected. So you will see de-financialization. Another company that you can think of, anyone? I just want to give you a grasp of it because 
then when you are you are reading on new liberalism right it is not what you see just theoretically it has something to do with singapore as well any other company you can think of One more minute. Temasa is one of the biggest backers of crypto in the region, isn't it? Signaling movement away from banks. Uh, yes, um, but Temasa is working closely. Uh, they created a joint venture. So Temasa has ownership, equity ownership of Standard Chartered Bank. And Standard Chartered Bank is going to have a partnership with NTUC, very strange. Let me just show you that. Okay. So, oh, can't get in. Okay, so can you see this? Standard Chartered Bank, I think um, Tomasic owns about 20 to 30 percent of Standard Chartered Bank and they struck a deal with NTUC of all entity. Okay, and because uh, NTUC has a network or support base by the unions and all these aunties that you know they tap their card and all these very excited about you know getting points. So they want to do a digital only bank in Singapore and uh, that that big group of people by itself gives standard chartered bank and that will effect. So basically the government will still control the digital bank moving forward. forward. Okay, so cryptocurrency is just one aspect of um, the blockchain that will eventually uh, be um, in the market for sure. Okay. But that is not financialization. That is create um, transforming the banking system. Another financialization, de-financialization. I'm sure you're very aware of this. Is uh, Mister the man who say he take umbrage? Okay, so you can read from there that uh, SPH. In the Straits time, I'm not sure you got it or not here. Yeah. Has been hive of the media part of it. Okay. So they gonna they have a two parts to SPH. One is the real estate investment trust. Okay, the real estate investment trust, like I said to you, uh, when SPH was actually a statutory board under the Ministry of Information. So they financialized the company. They corporatized it, financialized it, and SPH became a public listed company. Okay, so when the government transfer, um, hive off, spin off that company and become, transform it to a private company, the land that, you know, the, the buildings and land all was given to SPH. So they own that land. Okay, so SPH uh, eventually, when they started to grow bigger, they created the, the land part of it became a real invest, real estate investment trust. So you've got a media, you've got a real estate part. So the media has gone through a rough patch because of um, digital transformation and all. Nobody reads. Anyone still buy Straits Time hard copy? Anyone still do it? No, okay. Um, the privatization, yes. So the privatization is one aspect of it, but financialized, that means it was a public good. Okay, SPH was under the government, it was a public good. But once you privatize it, it becomes a private good. 
So it's financialized. Got it? And so even when you look at HDB flat, they still say it's a public housing. But the fact that you do, you remove the rent control, this okay, the rent control act means they used to cap the rent that uh, landowners can collect. But when they remove that in two thousand one, just before Lee Sin Long uh, become uh, became the prime minister in two thousand three, right? Uh, they removed the rent control act, and then you see the property prices keep going up because property prices. It's actually um, influenced by the amount of rent that you can collect, right? So if the rent keep going up, property prices keep going up. And that is how you financialize the land. You basically, uh, you government collectivize it and then they remove the Rent Control Act and financialization uh, took place. Capital land became much richer because they have a lot of land, that, uh, malls that they control, and then they have so many kinds of like commercial land, they have uh, condominiums, they got more, so they come out capital more, capital land, I don't know, capital commercial. So the new MOP is in a sense trying to reduce the price, the pricing of houses. Yeah, it's basically to, um, I wouldn't say it's a rent control act. I think it is, you know, indirectly it is a rent control act because you can't rent out, right? Am I right to say that? You can have, you have to stay in the house, right? Yeah, so you are not able to rent out. So in a prime area, there's a cap to it really. For those people, cannot rent whole house, can rent a room, rent out a room. Okay, so you can rent out a room, but they will start to give to young couples who are more likely uh, to stay at a place, okay? So the chances of people renting out will be uh, reduced drastic, dramatically, I would say. Okay, but if they put the Rent Control Act, like they, they reinstate that, right, the property prices across Singapore will collapse. Because, let's say we say, um, HGB flat, uh, at cap, $800, the rent finish. The price of property. And um, condominiums, right? Um, two thousand five hundred. Landed property four thousand dollars came over. Who will buy a fifth, uh, fifteen million dollar bungalow and rent out for four thousand dollars? Doesn't make sense anymore. Okay, even if it drops to a million, four thousand dollars doesn't make a uh, four thousand dollars still makes sense. But fifteen million, nobody's gonna, no, nobody's gonna buy it and then rent out. So you will buy how many houses? You buy one fifteen million dollar house and you stay. That's about it. So if let's say the market transaction drop, prices keep dropping. Okay, so the whole financialization actually when you remove the rent control act, you increase inequality. So those people who actually own private property, landed property, right? Um, all the way from 2001, all the way to maybe now, wow, big, a lot of money. Okay, and in 2009, when there was a global financial crisis, the government pumped in more money. They printed more money in the market. Okay, and uh, more loans were, were borrowed. Okay, so maybe I can show you. Yeah, I show you this. I just asked, yeah, I show you this. I forgot, I've been showing a lot of people. I did, okay. So we have a lot of debt because the government, when they want to come up with new projects, a property company or whatever not, so they need to borrow money from the market and um, the land become more expensive. You have to resort to borrowing money uh, through, you know, issuing government securities 
all corporate bonds and all this. So collectively, we have about $2.1 trillion in the private sector, which is actually, uh, most of them are capital and domestic companies, Sambawang, all these companies, they borrow a lot of money. In Sambawang Corporation, there's so many subsidiaries, capital got so many subsidiaries, Tomasi got so many um, companies under them. So you can imagine the amount of debt that has uh, increased because of the cost of um, land in Singapore. Okay, So they need to pay a lot of things. Everything has gone up with GST. So the bubble is so big, the debt is so big, and I'm not sure when is it that it will come to a halt. Okay, so um, not only the debt by the, the companies, the debt by Singaporeans. Singaporeans are incurring more debt. Do you, do you believe what I just said? Do you think Singaporeans are have taking up more loans? Hello? You don't follow. Everywhere, even in Malaysia, also same. Okay? Even in Thailand, also same. Because the property prices keep going up. Okay, the cost of living has gone up, but the wages have not gone up. So, what Chomsky was saying is that um, a lot of these companies have outsourced. So, our GLCs are like MNC. They outsource to China. They get cheap workers from abroad. They come here and... Um, and our wages are just stagnating, and um, the GLCs are making a lot of money. MNCs are also making a lot of money here, okay, with this uh, a huge amount of labor that is uh, available from the international market. Yeah. So when we say we save more in, in CPF, but we cannot take our CPF, uh, a lot of people, the CPF will not be enough to buy HDB flats, okay. Uh, it's only only to start off to pay for your down payment, but to really pay off the whole HTB flat, I doubt it. What it is here? Why is it that our savings? Why is it that is that why our savings rate appears so high? Uh, as in, is it because we? Have a lot in our CPF. Is that the question you're asking me, Brad? But no use since interest rates so low. Yeah, so they start to push. Um, they start to push. Yeah, because your CPF is not in CPF. Your CPF, you really use it to buy a house, really. Okay, so um, it's in one account that shows that you have utilized it to buy a house. So when you sell it, then you have to go, you bring it back to CPF. Okay, so it's so complex that, you know, it used to be so much easier that when you grow old at 55, you have this sum of money you can take out. Okay, so that's this forced saving that continue to force you with this new legislation called minimum sum. All right, so that's why, like what you say, Prem, our savings always appear very high because of this minimum sum. Okay, that itself, is very important because all these CPF are part of, can be a part of our Singapore Reserve because the CPF, the funds transferred to MAS, whereby CPF buy Singapore government securities, okay, and then um, it is considered part of the reserve. Really. So because we, you know, beef out our reserve through by transferring our CPF fund to MAS there. And MES would actually uh, face out the money to GSC, which is actually an investment company there. Okay? Yeah. You are forced to buy over the bonds. Because CPF decide for us. And when the government, when the CPF transfer to MES, because MES were out the Singapore government bonds, right? We are subjected uh, to what MES wants to do, okay? So if let's say um, now CPF come up with a new legislation, say your minimum sum have keep increasing, let's say four five hundred thousand dollars, you have to follow because it's government, right? At the same time, if they need to take more money, then they'll face out more money to MES. MES will face out to GIC. 
Got it? So that is why some people say that the moment um, the CPF money transferred to MAS, we lost our legal rights over it because it, it, it was a transaction done. Got it? So it's like one in one pocket to another pocket, but the, the CPF account holder cannot hold CPF accountable anymore because CPF say your oh, money is with MAS. Okay, they owe us money. So wait until they pay us back, then we can pay you. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, argument and a lot of discontent. And uh, until today, the minimum sum. Can anyone tell me how much is it? I just want you to find out yourself because it's your money. So they financialize the saving. They do forced saving and instead um, open up that pension fund, the pension account. And they create a fund that is run by GIC. Okay, hundred and eighty six thousand two hundred thousand. Okay, so now I ask you, hundred and eighty six is minimum sum. But if you buy a house four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, now going to one million dollars, do you still have enough? Do you have three hundred thousand after that? I doubt it, unless you must be damn bloody lucky to make good money, right? So let's say you pay off your house. Let's say, will you still have 186,000 per person? Very, the chances are very low. So if you see a husband and wife at 186,000 becomes 372,000. And if they sell a house of $1 million, $1.37 million, what will you do? Will you leave your life or your savings to this government? Or you take the money and you get out. Move out, right? Okay, so now you move out, the government happy. No? The government sure them happy. Why? They must find new victim. Huh? <laughs> so easy to replace. So many people around waiting to you know, chase that Singapore dream. So it's basically chasing a shadow. So a lot of people immigrate. Okay. I do not have the numbers, but do you feel that a lot of people are just, you know, a lot of new people coming in all the time, okay, to replace the older citizen. But the people who are very, very old, they don't need to do that because they already got their CPF. Okay, those in their 70s, and some got pension, you know, they don't need to do that. Those people in their 40s and 50s, a lot of them have moved out. So that is why, actually, it is exacerbating our aging population. Because the 40s and 50s have children, they, they go overseas. The young people, plus their children, will go overseas. So do you think the aging population will worsen in the case? If this continues. Like me, you know. What are the chances? Do you think they can they can uh, resolve the aging population issue when the people in their 30s and 40s just get out? Because when they see the time it's for them to take a CPA, they better get the money and get out first. Okay? So, other reasons is like education seems to be like, you know, murderous. So, people get out altogether. And uh, so, this is not just in Singapore. It is, it is also prevalent in America where financialization happens. But, but the very wealthy people don't need to worry about all these things because they are they have a lot of cash. So the middle, right, always stuck with that system where the institution imposes rules on you and you do not have that money to spend. So this is a problem that we face. And uh, is it is it just Singapore? I think Malaysia have the same problem. Their property prices have gone up so high. Okay, everything is financialized also. So those land that was used for farming has been uh, modernized to condominiums and all these uh, properties that they were selling. So who lose out? The farmers lose out. They got no job. Okay? And uh, those people who are uh, property developers uh, are making a lot of profit from that. Okay? So you can see the inequality um, across the world because of this financialization. Okay?
And uh, I'm not sure what's the next thing the government going to do. But I, but you read the news that they say they're going to basically um, not allow people to just um, buy the HDB flat and rent out and all this. So this is a step forward to definancialize the system. So you have SPH coming out. You have um, SMRT, okay, um, basically all these two delisted. So what happened? SMRT, um, the assets been transferred, the transportation asset were transferred to LTA. Okay, uh, whereas the the what is it called? All those stores that they have, they still under SMRT. At some point, they will consolidate. I don't know if we capital more or something like that. Okay, so you're gonna see a lot of consolidation coming up, and that in itself tells you that the number of thematic wing companies will be reduced moving forward okay and um, if i remember correctly this Lee Sin Lung, during the financial crisis say he doesn't want to develop a domestic number two which means to say he doesn't want to have this sovereign wealth fund okay i would not be surprised at some point they will merge gic and domestic because you don't need two sovereign wealth fund for a country like singapore one will do but I'm not sure how they're going to do it, okay? But uh, the whole of Singapore, the wealth is $1.3 trillion. But the debt is $2.5 trillion. Okay? So our debt to GDP, right? The GDP is the wealth that we have. Wow. It's about, you know, 200%. And, and that's how the Sing dollar is so strong. Because the more you roll out there, more people buy it, buy into Singapore dollars. So the Singapore dollar becomes very strong. But the moment they pull out of that debt, again, okay, they sell it off in the market, right? They want to convert back to US dollar or Australian dollars or, or Roman P or whatever not, okay? Then the demand for Sing dollar will drop, the Singapore dollar will drop. And that is why they're pushing very hard to open up the economy very quickly. Hopefully that more people will still um, have confidence in the Singapore economy. So when you have confidence, you'll place, you'll park your money here. Okay? But fortunately for the time being, uh, Taiwan and and and, and Hong Kong, uh, they are facing some problems with China. So you see some high net worth clients coming, uh, shifting from Hong Kong and Taiwan to Singapore. Okay? And some of the Chinese people as well. But um, I don't think that in itself will be enough to sustain the Singapore dollar. So what I'm trying to say is that the bubble that we have now is even bigger than 2009 global financial crisis. Because the 2009 global financial crisis, the government didn't allow the economy to go down and you're supposed to go down. Instead, they roll out more debt. So we have more debt now. Okay? And the Sing dollar uh, continues to be very strong. And now you're facing another problem. They want to keep the sting dollar strong because the imports, okay, uh, the prices of imports are going to increase. So to sterilize or to ensure that the prices of imports that increase, you want to sterilize it, let's say by 10%, then you have to increase the sting dollar by another 10%. So to do that, you will do what? You will do up more debt again. Okay, so I'm not sure at some point uh, the bubble will burst. I'm just waiting. Any question for me so far? So that's how Singapore moved out of the social democracy in 1984 uh, when Bo Keng the pioneer generation PAP leaders stepped down. Okay. Uh, they removed the system, they transformed the system away from, they navigate um, away from social democracy and towards market principles. And to do that, they financialize the whole system. They um, transform a lot of the stat boards, uh, becoming uh, government-linked companies and domestic companies. Yeah. Okay, so now we are in, in a big mess. It's a it's a fix that I don't think Ho Chi is going to do it because she just stepped aside to be the chairman of Tomasic Foundation. So she's like trying to be the good person, give you masks, give you sanitizer give you mouthwash, uh, I don't know, give a lot of things, okay? So she's not in a driving seat, 
or she's not going to be the scapegoat for anything to happen with the Marseille company. So. All right, do you get it? The new liberal construct, both in the uh, United States and in Singapore. And I just have feedback. Do you have any question you want to ask? Okay. Only one person say any question. How about the rest? No. Okay. So this is very important here. Why? Because we are looking at the financial market. One of those things that we have to discuss in our IPE um, is the end of neoliberalism, the rise of mercantilism. Okay. So the, the neoliberal... Um, problem or the neoliberalism when it when it reached its limit uh, comes mercantilism and that brings us to the point of the recurring pattern of new uh, liberalism to mercantilism okay so 2016 uh, was the, was the inflection point of mercantilism in the United States so Singapore is caught uh, with the pants down because um, they have always positioned the whole economy for interdependence and now it has broken down all right so this brings us back to this part here all right um all these new liberalism actually it started with 1945 when uh, they had the idea of embedded liberalism so i'm just going through the globalization part here all right and embedded liberalism comes with the gold exchange system the gold exchange system um, wasn't feasible for United States. Why? Because they needed to um, to show to support the U.S. dollar with gold. Okay, so they wanted to shift, or you know, to shift the whole IPE system, and not to use or tell people how much gold they have. They put it bluntly. Okay, so instead they chose another route. They were to use that instrument, okay, bonds, um, to support the U.S. dollar. So they keep their gold aside. They, nobody knows how much gold America would have. But until today, if I'm not wrong, it still has the highest amount of gold. But they don't need to declare anymore. But in those days, when you were under the gold exchange system, they needed to um, declare how much gold they have to support to for people to justify the value of the U.S. dollar. So when they have bonds, uh, they don't need to do that anymore. So basically, it created another financial instrument. So they expanded the U.S. financial system. But the political uh, objective behind it was to create what that outsourcing um, activity, okay, allow the MNCs to go overseas and... Out, um, do their manufacturing and the United States government do not need to spend money which I've just said to you the infrastructure will be developed in the Asian NIEs there okay so at that point in time here there was this developmental project there and they were you know encouraging the Asian NIEs to go for export oriented industry okay and they were in the end buy US treasury so the Asian government will have to buy have to spend money on the infrastructure so when you go to Korea, you got great infrastructure, you got underground train also, they get very clean. You go to Taiwan now also, you have an MRT system, you got free internet off. Singapore, great infrastructure. Japan, great infrastructure. Hong Kong, great infrastructure. So these countries, the governments were spending money to what? Uh, to ensure that the MNCs will be happy to stay on and um, to continue the manufacturing in those countries there without, without spending money at all. The U.S. government doesn't need to spend money. Okay, the um, the other one, the MNCs don't need to spend money. They just try to advise the government through the Chamber of Commerce on what kind of infrastructure would be um, very attractive to the MNCs there. So here in Singapore, you see that Lee Kuan Yew always say, "Oh, we must do this, do that. We get the MNCs here." The whole purpose was to create jobs there. So basically they were to create jobs in 
for export oriented industries and uh, modernize at the same time the um, the infrastructure in this region here. So everyone was like, yeah, you know, the rise of Asia. And then um, China joined in the bandwagon at the same time. And China modernized, the infrastructure modernized. Everyone said it's the rise of China. But nobody was looking at it from a political perspective. That the United States government did not need to spend any amount of money on infrastructure. They say, oh, we are leaving it to the market. Again, the MNCs uh, left the country at the same time, they were only focusing on one thing, that they will create a consumption-based economy. So the ideas all came from America. Okay, even when you buy Apple, you buy clothing, okay, everything was from America. You got softwares, everything all from America, but then it is all produced cheaply in China, then subsequently India, um, okay, then uh, also, also the Asian NIEs. And even the maintenance and repair, of AV of uh, aeroplanes were all done in in, in this in these countries. So, so the government did not need to spend anything. They just focus on R and D. Okay, the value chain right of the lower end and the middle one all go to Asia. That was the rise of Asia, and at the same time, uh, this was also to rival the Latin Americans who had the idea of creating a new international order. Okay, they didn't want to have the export oriented industry. Why? Because you'll be dependent on um, the MNCs, and they were like anti-MNCs then, because they know that the power will shift to the MNC. So the state or Latin American governments did not want that to happen. Instead, they wanted to uh, maintain those uh, control over their own industrialization. So what did they do? They start to band together and try to develop their own industry. Of course, it failed. And but the Latin American idea was very, uh, was in line with what the Soviet Union was doing. Okay, they created their own industry. Everything was inward looking. They have their own oil and gas, military, you know, aviation, all everything. They have computers. All. So they were subscribing to the Soviet ways of doing things there. So eventually, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, the new international order that was subscribed or advocated by the Latin Americans also collapsed altogether. So that is why uh, Lee Kuan Yew and the other Southeast Asian countries or other Asian NIEs were very important players for the Americans. So they were to show to the world that if you were to subscribe to the MNC model, the export-oriented industry, you have a chance to actually modernize and accumulate surplus and all you need to do after that is to support the U.S. dollar. Okay, so that all, all of this blend in very well. At the same time, America does not need to, you know, uh, show its goal. You can just create that and that and more and more that. Okay, and the whole of Asia would be the ones that are financing the debt of America. So the number one now is China. Number two is Japan. Okay, and I believe uh, number three it's. It's not Singapore. I think Singapore is four or five. You have Taiwanese and Koreans also buying the U.S. Treasury there. Okay, Hong Kong also buy U.S. Treasury. Okay, so all of that ended, and then we have this neoliberalism. Okay, neoliberalism where they basically just embrace financialization. Okay, or to begin with was Americanization. Okay, and Americanization at that point in time was financialization. And all of that lasted for eight plus eight, 16 years, and it collapsed. Okay, 16 years. And in unipolar world, in the financial system, we had a lot of financialization. And, but Singapore went on because we have still have reserves, right? So we pushed all the way to 2016, and then we saw SMRT uh, got delisted. Now we see 2020 or 2021 SPH got delisted. Okay. So are you able to follow this? Are you able to follow this? If you have any question, please ask me. Because you're going to write about this in your essay.
I'm not sure exactly what, but you might need to use this. Yong Sing, you understand this? Need some time to absorb, okay. What about Oliver? Trying to understand. Okay. Hmm. Breaking a note. Sir. Generally, do you get it? Because you don't need to know the details after you up, until you read it again. Generally, do you get the grasp of it? Okay. So it's very important you you get the idea of uh, neoliberalism is actually an extension of embedded liberalism. Okay, there was a political experiment going on there. Uh, the contest of ideas that between the Soviet Union and the United States at the same time, the developmental project that you know was uh, in between the embedded liberalism to neo neoliberalism. Neoliberalism would not have happened if the new international order uh, would be subs uh, have, um, overtaken, surpassed that um, e developmental projects. So in this part of the world, they were afraid that Russia right, or Soviet Union would eventually um, win the American because um, the government here in Asia, they were all aligned uh, with America. Is new conservatism also a meditation? Maybe you can tell me what is new conservatism in your own words first. What do you understand of it? Pressure other countries adopt American democracy. Um, yeah, they usually show they use their own allies. They don't really direct pre directly pressure. They use uh, their allies as a, an example for other people to follow. So. In that sense, yes. If it's uh, what Ji Young is saying. Yeah, people got different people got different uh, interpretation of neo conservatism. Maybe. Okay. So you have to be very careful when you. But please don't write neo conservatism, just write neo liberalism. Keep, keep it simple. Alright, so the dependency theory failed and Latin America eventually followed the um, financialization also. Okay, so there was a vacuum at some point in Latin America when the Soviet Union collapsed. So they moved on to the uh, new liberal construct of opening up their economy and they went through a lot of crises. And until today, Latin America is still stuck with financial crisis. Okay, you got the, the Argentinian crisis. Okay, and then you have the um, the other crisis is the Mexican crisis. I think neocon support military intervention like the Afghan in like that in Afghan, but neoliberals don't. Yeah, neoliberals they are more into the markets. The neoconservatism, I think, more in the security there. Okay, that one is coercion. That's my understanding of it. 
So if you put new new conservatism next side by side with new liberalism, then uh, you have to be very clear already that in your opinion that new conservatism uh, was to use to have a strong military presence. So which is the Asian NIEs, you have to they support a strong military presence of America in Asia, in the Pacific. Okay. At the same time, they are rewarded for following the economic policies of Americans, okay? And that in itself was to financialize. And they open up their market to, um, to allow MNCs to work closely with MNCs and then uh, expand the global production network for the MNCs. So side by side. So you should be able to know by now that in every location a superpower has um, economic interests they will also have their military post there. So you have that in South Korea, you have, uh, now you now you still have in Japan, you have in Singapore, you have in Taiwan, hush hush, not saying it out, but they are there to, ready to defend Taiwan. Okay, got it? So you can bring the security in by saying that uh, America has interests and, and has its military presence. By feeding, by feeding these countries, uh, they help them to modernize also. But at the same time, uh, they, are, they, they welcome uh, the American military in the region there. And until today, when you see that, uh, that the tension between the US and China, right, uh, you see these allies have been activated to, you know, uh, allow America to uh, closely watch what's happening in the region there. So um, all these occurs and whatever squads and all these things are, are tied to um, the economic policies that um, these countries support. The economic policies that come out from Washington itself. Okay, so that those are like rewards. Okay, that's how America remains a hegemon in that liberal construct. Got it? All right, so the unipolar world, you have no Soviet Union. Uh, you don't need, the Americans don't need to spend so much on military anymore. So the armed race was over. So the containment policy was uh, gone. And by the time they reached 2001, okay, um, the next thing that they were more concerned was the rise of China. So by 2008, Obama had pivoted to Asia. Okay? So in after 16 years, after the Cold War, there's this, uh, the new conservatism came up again that they want to secure their strong military presence in Asia. Although there was a rise in Asia, there was a rise of China. Okay, so they want to pivot towards Asia, and uh, that in itself uh, turned out to to be uh, quite bad because now you see they look at the rise of China as a mercantilist state, and the interdependence have broken down altogether because the reaction from China is somewhat very negative, and uh, they are not subscribing that the Americans have a greater presence in the region. Okay, so everyone is calling each other names and Americans are accusing China for being, uh, trying to break the deal and uh, trying too hard to overtake um, America in the region as a regional power. Okay, so when you say you are a superpower, you are also a regional power. But the argument of the Chinese is that we just want to be a power in the region. But the Americans say you cannot be a power in the region because all of whatever you have and all the modernization and all the surpluses you had, okay, and have, uh, although you own it, right, the U.S. Treasury, it because we started it, we import your goods, okay, we increase the marginal propensity to import. Let me just type this out. Again, the marginal propensity to import means if the Americans do not import, right? They did not. The Americans did not import. Then China will not grow. They will not be able to export. Again, okay? 
So the form, the, the deal was that as much as you you have a lot of your tre you own a lot of the US treasury, but it's because we help you to grow, you accumulate surplus, then you own those treasuries. Okay? So if without us, you would have never ever have modernized. Okay, because we asked those allies of ours, the Asian NIEs there. They did the experiment all the way to the you know from the 70s to the 90s. And 90s, your growth started to accelerate from 1991 to 2001 when you joined the WTO. Okay, so it was basically a political experiment and you agreed to it. So now you tell us you want to be a regional power. So the Americans are saying then we call off the interdependence. Okay, so we reduce our marginal propensity to import, which means to say we are the biggest customer, right? Your economy will stop. Okay, so what is happening in China? So if you look at my IP URL, let me just go to it here. To make it more exciting. So China will have forecasted to have high inflation, slow growth. The slow growth is because the Americans are not buying from them. The marginal propensity to import will be reduced. Why would they have high inflation? Because there's an energy crisis. Okay. At the same time, um, your cost of living goes up. Okay. Your rent has gone up. So inflation is a, a big problem for China now. And to, in order to overcome that, they must be able to export to grow. Then the inflation doesn't seem that bad. But now is you have going to have slow growth because Americans will want to reduce their marginal propensity to import. Okay, so this this itself tells us this this article tells us very clearly what the whole interdependence was all about. Can you get a grasp of it? Hello. Can you get a grasp of it? We're going for a break soon. So James Morrison wants you to use real life example like all these articles you know, to explain the um, the real risk. China having a real risk of stagflation. Okay, and you apply that to the um, the interdependence that has broken down. If you are able to explain like that, then you're going to be the Superman or Superwoman. Okay, so um, of course the Chinese will argue that why is it that even if you don't help us, we are still a regional power. Okay, so but from the perspective of the Americans, is that we help you to get out of poverty, we help you to modernize. I think you're you are too ambitious to try to be a regional power. But for the Chinese, it's like, but without our cheap labor, uh, you would have not have this chance of rolling out more debt and getting cheap stuff made in China going to the United States of America. And uh, long ago, the American supremacy would have declined because uh, you will not be able to grow so much. And your MNCs are all declaring a lot of profit in on Wall Street. Okay, your financial market was able to expand further because of us, okay? So the, the, the debate goes on and on. But I hope you have an understanding of how this new liberalism started, okay, started by the, expand, the extension of embedded liberalism. And then after that, it went on to break down, okay? But in between, there was this contest of ideology. Yeah, the American companies are divesting from China. So you can see they are realigning their production network. They, put, they are parking their money in Vietnam, so to speak. Got it? down by financialization yeah 
um, if that were to happen, that means they, they must still grow in a way, they must still find a market to grow right now. And if they just do financialization, the Communist Party, what will happen? They will lose control. No? You see Singapore, the PAP is still a legitimate, pow legitimate party, but then you know, their control over the people has somewhat been uh, reduced or is starting to decline. Okay, so they have to choose, they have to opt for something. You want to open up your economy, okay, and then, but eventually you have to um, liberalize politically as well. But if you don't, right, you, you, you continue like that and you want to sustain this kind of control, um, your economy will stagnate and that stagflation will definitely emerge. And it's a very real risk. Got it? So basically, this article tells you the two scenarios that could happen in China. So when you write about China, right, and I believe he's going to ask a question on China, you got to bring in China as from the liberal perspective there. Later, you look at one question on there, there will be a question on China, okay, uh, from the IPE perspective of the liberals. Then you would like to look at China as a mercantilist state at the same time uh, thriving and emerging in a liberal order. So you need to draw it all the way what I've explained to you and how China actually has thrived from the interdependence. Okay, but at the same time, uh, there's, there's a, there are limits to interdependence. Okay, because it actually contains China in some respect. Yeah, it cannot be a regional power. It's still very dependent on the United States of America. Okay, um, is it possible theoretically to create their own consumption-based economy? Yes, but is it possible within a short frame of time without um, going through economic chaos? No, because it's too drastic for them. And um, unless they keep rolling out bonds to help the people to consume based on what is produced within China, well, that, that, that looks like a self-reliant country and it looks like more communist and it's going to be very costly. Okay, so if that were to happen, at the same time, the Americans are pushing China to increase on defense spending. So the whole economy will improve as well. Okay, I'm just giving you aspects of uh, how you would like to write on the rights of China here. Because China... Um, I've always been saying they, they subscribe to globalization. Right? So this is actually a problem for them. Now. All right, let's take a break first. It's 5.03. Um, come back at 5.18. We'll look at the rest of the slides.